Okay, so for regular viewers of my channel, this video might seem a bit confusing. Didn't I already post a video on solving the Dirac equation for the Landau levels using the ladder operator method? And the answer is I did, but there were some typos, and there were enough typos that were consequential that I really felt I needed to replace the video. Now, when you're doing work this complicated, typos, and the occasional conceptual error is just an inevitability, and most of them are just a few minor typos, and I can address them in the comments section, which is actually why I really recommend you check the comments section on any of my videos, because you might find something that's confusing you, and it turns out it actually is an error, and it's addressed and explained in the comments section. I also add clarifications sometimes, so definitely check that. But in this case, the first one started too early in the video and was too consequential as far as how it affected the results, so I'm just doing what, you know, I'll have to do on occasion, and that is make a video that doesn't have it in it. So let's get to it. In a previous video, link in the description, I cover the problem of solving the Schrodinger equation for a charged particle in the presence of a constant magnetic field in the z-direction by tradition. In that video, we not only found this problem to be exactly solvable, but we found, quite miraculously, that it could be solved very quickly and easily via the same raising and lowering operator method famously used in the quantum harmonic oscillator problem, the resulting xy plane quantized energy levels being known as Landau levels. Specifically, we define these raising and lowering operators in terms of these pi operators, which are just the adjusted momentum associated with the minimal coupling substitution prescription that presumably you're familiar with by now. We then verified that the AA dagger commutator actually does yield the required result for these to behave like raising and lowering operators. Now, I want to make it clear here where the fact that the magnetic field we're using is pointing in the z direction actually comes in here. If you're not paying attention, where that piece of information comes in in the problem is not so clear. It's coming in from the fact that we're taking this commutator to be proportional to the entire magnitude of the magnetic field. And I guess you could argue it's also kind of coming in from the fact that this quantity under the square root here is also proportional to the complete magnitude of the magnetic field when it really is supposed to be equal to just the z component in order for these commutators to actually yield the one value that it needs to. So all of that basically reflects the fact that we are taking this magnetic field to be in the z direction. You don't see a subscript z here anywhere even though it is the z component because the z component is all the magnetic field has got. Now it's also important and quite interesting to note that given the nature of this operator formalism, we never actually have to reference the vector potential explicitly, even though it explicitly enters the Dirac equation, which means that we don't actually have to pick a gauge to do this problem, at least since we're just going for the eigenvalues and not the eigenfunctions. If we wanted to calculate the eigenfunctions, that would force us to pick a gauge regardless of what we did. But since we're not doing that, we actually have the luxury of leaving our entire calculation gauge invariant. Anyway, continuing on, we found that the Hamiltonian for the Schrodinger equation could be written like this, and we found that the energy eigenvalues were therefore this, where these are those Landau levels I was talking about, and then this just reflects that it's free in the z direction, as is intuitive given how magnetic fields work. Now my reason for drawing your attention to these equations is to remind you that an A dagger A goes to an N, we're going to see A dagger A factors showing up, and the whole point of this process being so fast is that because we already know how harmonic oscillators work, and we've already done the Schrodinger case for this specific problem, we're abundantly familiar with this transition, and we can just write out the eigenvalues extremely fast. The other reason why I'm doing it is we'll take the non-relativistic limit and the spinless limit on the relativistic equation that we get, and we expect it to reproduce the Schrodinger result, which therefore means it's useful to remind you what the Schrodinger result actually is supposed to be. Now, as I mentioned earlier, much to my original surprise, this same method can also be used to solve the Dirac equation version of this problem for a relativistic quantum particle that's spin half. 
Now this surprised me primarily because, as you can see here, the Dirac equation is first order, so there's no clear way to get an A dagger A product to show up, which definitely is second order. It's clear how that could happen in the Klein-Gordon equation, but the Dirac equation? Before learning explicitly that this is actually a way to solve the Dirac equation too, I wouldn't have thought that you could do that. It just wouldn't have occurred to me. Now the point of this video, therefore, is to show you the trick for getting it to happen, and it is pretty cool. The process begins by expanding out the dot product in the Dirac equation and inserting the fact that the electron is free in the z direction, so that gets us here. Now I'm being a bit sloppy with the wave function, technically I should set psi equal to the z phase that gives us this factor there times another function, but we're not doing much explicit wave function work in this video because we're just going for the eigenvalues, and so I didn't bother to be too picky about that. Now if we remember what the alpha matrices are, at least in the most ordinary representation, which is the one that's really useful to us here, and insert just the first two, we immediately see a's and a daggers showing up, at least if we also multiply and divide by this square root here. But this equation is still first order, so there's no way for the a dagger a products that we know how to turn into n's to show up. This is where the clever trick comes in. We can apply another copy of the Hamiltonian to the effect of getting an e squared on this side of the equation instead of an e, and then multiply it out. If we remember that alphas and betas anti-commute and square to one, we arrive at this relatively simple result. We see some of the a dagger a products that we need, but these two aren't quite in the right form. If we use the anti-commutation relations to fix that at the cost of a one term, we arrive at this result here. We see that the spin up and spin down components satisfy different equations. Now this is quite an interesting idea because we're used to the square of the Dirac operator being equal to the Klein-Gordon operator. And from that we're used to relying on the fact that each of the components in a Dirac bispinner should satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. But the Klein-Gordon equation doesn't have spin in it, so what's going on here? In cases where the energy eigenvalues are spin dependent, there's no guarantee that each of these components will satisfy exactly the same version of the Klein-Gordon equation. They'll satisfy some valid Klein-Gordon equation, but not necessarily the same one as the other components. And that's exactly what's happening here. We have an electron which has spin in a magnetic field. It's obviously going to change the energy whether it's aligned or anti-aligned with the magnetic field. So this is actually quite intuitive. Now for the spin up, we just have these energy eigenvalues, where I've reintroduced the c's here because there isn't much calculating left to do. I mean, there wasn't anyway, but whatever. I've also introduced the cyclotron frequency. It has the same formula as it did in the Schrodinger picture video. Now if we go down here to the spin down component, we see that we do get different energy eigenvalues. There's this plus one there. But this change from n to n plus one means that we can actually compactly combine those energy eigenvalues by inventing this quantum number, and we get this very elegant result. Notice that when we ignore spin, we just get this result, which is the Klein-Gordon result. It's quite easy to sit down and do that problem. It's really just the same as the Schrodinger problem. We can also Taylor expand the Dirac formula to get the non-relativistic limit. Performing that gives us this result, so we have non-relativistic but still spin half, which means we've just found the energy eigenvalues for the Pauli equation. If we then ignore spin again, but on the non-relativistic limit here, well, we have the Schrodinger results that we expected to get. We've therefore accomplished our mission. We've used the raising and lowering operator method to solve the Dirac equation, and we've not only gotten very elegant results for that, but we've used them through the spinless and non-relativistic limit to reproduce the already familiar Schrodinger result. And that's about all I got for this one. I hope this video is interesting. Thanks for watching.